great. Looks like people are joining now. So thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Jasmine, and it's my pleasure to introduce today, today's Breer Talks Research webinar series, Understanding Hospital to Home Transitions in Palliative Care. Uh, first, I just want to note that this presentation and the discussion are being recorded, and they will be available later. Uh, we'll also be taking all the questions at the end of the session, so you can submit your written questions throughout the presentation with the Q&A button at the bottom of the window, or you can use the raise hand icon if you want to ask a question live during the Q&A portion, we'll unmute you. Uh, feel free to message fellow attendees throughout the session in the chat box. And with all that said, I'd like to start introducing our speakers today. First off, uh, Serena Eisenberg, PhD. She holds the chair in mixed methods palliative care research here at the Bria Research Institute. Uh, she's also an assistant professor in the Department of Medicine at the University of Ottawa, as well as the Department of Family and Community Medicine and the Institute for Health Policy Management and Evaluation at the University of Toronto. Uh, she's also a professor at the Department of Health Policy and Management at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And she was recently inducted into the American Association of Hospice Palliative Medicine Research Scholars Program. Her research focuses on examining access to palliative care for marginalized and non-cancer populations and testing ways to improve access and quality of care. Our second speaker today is Stephanie Saunders, who's pursuing a dual master's of science in physical therapy and a PhD at McMaster University in rehabilitation sciences. Her PhD work is focused on examining fall risk in community dwelling older adults. And prior to her current studies, she completed a master's in human kinetics and worked as a research coordinator in palliative care at Toronto's Mount Sinai Hospital's Temi Latner Center for Palliative Care. Her research interests tie together the importance of physical movement with creative knowledge translation efforts to improve quality of life. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to our speakers, Serena. Thank you so much, Jasmine, for that introduction, and thank you for having us today. Um, this research has really been a labor of love, and I'm excited to be sharing it with you. Uh, so we don't have any conflicts to disclose. Uh, next. And this work was funded by the Gold Define Award at the Temi Latner Center for Palliative Care at Sinai Health in Toronto, as well as the CAS Family Grant for Catalyzing Access and Change in the Department of Family and Community Medicine, um, and also the Neurosurgery Research and Education Fund. So uh, we cobbled together different sources of funding for this work, and I want to acknowledge that when the bulk of this work was done, I was a scientist at the Temi Latner Center and Steph was uh, a research coordinator working with me. And uh, now that I'm here at Briere, we'll be moving forward this research program here. Uh, next. So we wanna get started with a poll to understand who's here in the audience and what you know about the topic. So um, Jasmine, if you could launch the poll. So just let us know who you are and uh, what you know about the topic. Um, I'll give you just a bit of time to uh, complete it, and then we'll have a look at who's present. Okay. So I'll give you 10 more seconds to complete it. Okay, uh, Jasmine, if you could close the poll and launch the results. Okay, so we've got 63% of people here are researchers, 90% uh, are healthcare providers, and 90% are administrative or support staff within a healthcare organization. So a lot of individuals who will be familiar with healthcare, but will also, um, you know, keep this uh, broad and uh, help to explain this in terms that are not just full of research jargon. Um, so we've got actually a, a fair bit of people who are familiar with hospital home transitions, either professionally or personally. Um, and these are general hospital to home transitions. So uh, interesting that um, most people here are familiar with them, but we do see less people uh, familiar with these hospital home transitions for those specifically um, receiving palliative care. Uh, and now in terms of what you hope to learn, uh, so a lot of people are interested in the existing research. 
uh, with uh, some people interested in the uh, healthcare provider perspective and patient and caregiver perspective. So we are going to be covering all four of these topics today. Uh, so I'm excited to, to share this with you. So thanks for participating and we really appreciate you being here with us. Next slide. Okay, so why are we focusing on hospital home transitions and palliative care? Well, this work started when I was shadowing um, healthcare providers or palliative care physicians at Mount Sinai Hospital in Toronto. And I was trying to uh, observe and understand what are some of the major issues that they encounter in their clinical program. And in talking to the head of the inpatient palliative care program at Mount Sinai, Ramona uh, Matani, I asked her what was the biggest problem that they faced and she said, hands down, it's transitioning people to home from palliative care. It's something that we've struggled with for years and um, so I started asking around uh, to understand if others also felt this way and it was a resounding yes. And I talked to people at other institutions and time and time again I heard that this was an issue that people were having. Um, so at the time we decided to start researching this topic to understand more about it. Uh, next. A bit of background, um, and we'll be sharing more of the literature with you as we go on. So as some of you may know, many uh, dying individuals prefer to die at home. And so transitions from hospital to home are very common at end of life. So uh, the individuals who are in the hospital can get to a home setting. We know, however, that these transitions can be challenging for all individuals involved. So healthcare providers, patients, and their families. Patients who transition at the end of life can be vulnerable um, to complications and rehospitalizations. And this relates to a number of factors, but it also includes deteriorating health and also increased care needs. Studies have shown that poor transitions at this phase of life can lead to newer worsening symptoms for patients, increased lengths of stays, uh, misinterpretations of care plans, potential delays in follow-up and disruptions in the continuity of care. So these can be really problematic uh, for patients and caregivers' health and well-being. Next. So what we wanted to do uh, initially was to understand what the literature on this topic was and also study it ourselves in our own setting to eventually figure out ways to improve this transition. Next. So we're gonna be presenting several different studies to you today that were conducted over the last uh, three years or so. So we'll be starting with the systematic review and qualitative metasynthesis, then sharing findings from a qualitative study we led, then a mixed methods study and a design installation knowledge translation. All of these are on the topic of hospital home transitions and palliative care. Next. I'm going to be presenting the systematic review and metasynthesis together um, in tandem. They're both related very strongly to one another. Um, so next. So the systematic review looks at inpatient specialized palliative care programs and how they impact patient outcomes and healthcare utilization across the transition trajectory. So this was specifically patients transitioning home who are receiving palliative care in both settings to understand how inpatient palliative care might impact that transition. The metasynthesis wanted to understand the healthcare provider's perspective on the transition of patients um, who were receiving palliative care. So it was the synthesis of the qualitative studies, uh, which are studies that involve interviews and focus groups. Next. So very briefly, this is the eligibility criteria for which studies be included. The systematic review was very broad. We uh, looked at several different study designs. And as I mentioned, patients have to be receiving palliative care um, in both the hospital and home setting. And studies uh, had to have a comparison group not receiving palliative care. The metasynthesis was, again, focusing on qualitative studies and had to involve the perspective of healthcare providers and include a component of this transition. Next. So in systematic reviews, we share these uh, PRISMA diagrams, which show you the flow of studies. Uh, so in the systematic review, we initially identified 1,514 studies. And after screening, we resulted in only eight studies, which suggests you know, there is a lot of research that needs to be done in this space. 
In our metasynthesis, we started with 1,611 studies and resulted in 12 studies. Again, not a high number of studies and suggested that there needs to be more work. Next. So in terms of results, uh, in the qualitative, in the, sorry, systematic review, we got a wide variety of study designs. And most studies, we evaluated the quality of studies um, using two different risk assessment tools and found that they were uh, pretty much of low quality. Most of these studies were relatively recent and most of them were conducted in the US. We hear a lot about multidisciplinary or interprofessional care and most of these studies had um, team compositions with a variety of health professionals. So all studies had palliative care nurses and then we had some studies with palliative care physicians, social workers, chaplains, nurse practitioners, case managers, and one with pharmacists. The studies uh, interventions that were looked at can be grouped into three categories. So there were studies that used a, a screening tool to initiate palliative care consultations and then looked at outcomes related to the transition. There were studies that included discharge planning for the community as the intervention. And there were, was one study that had an intervention that spanned the hospital and community where the nurse met with the patient while they were in a hospital and followed up with them when the patient was at home. There are common outcomes studied, including length of stay, discharge support, and hospital readmissions, but notably outcomes that were missing were patient reported outcomes and patient centered outcomes. Very few studies actually looked at the patient opinion of the quality of transition they were receiving. Most of these studies focused on health utilization outcomes. So what can we conclude from this uh, really mixed bag of research? Uh, next slide, please. So as I said, um, there was a mix of work, so we can't quite have definitive conclusions, but we do know from what we saw that palliative care involvement during the transition can increase the likelihood of being discharged with support services and decrease hospital readmission rates. So it does show some promise. Uh, there was some evidence to suggest that transitional programs or streamlined inpatient discharge processes could also show pro promise for improving utilization outcomes. Uh, as I mentioned, most studies were at high risk of bias and deemed to be low quality, so we should apply the findings cautiously to clinical care. And I mentioned as well that there was a need for patient reported outcomes in a more patient centered approach. So future studies should use standardized outcome measures and use more high quality study designs to test the effectiveness of the intervention. Next. So what did we find from the qualitative medicine synthesis? So again, most of the studies were published recently. Half of the studies were based in the UK and there were two in Norway and one each in Canada, New Zealand, Singapore, and the US. There was a range of qualitative methods used. And what we did is we synthesized this broad researcher research into three categories to try and understand what is the healthcare provider's perspective of these transitions. So the first area that healthcare providers identified was that they're involved in assessing the possibility of transition and preparing for the transition. And the way healthcare providers um, prepared for the transition and made this assessment that discharge home was possible was they first considered patient and family awareness and understanding of illness and care preferences, which was really integral uh, to this decision-making process. Then they thought about whether the transition was suitable based on care requirements and importantly, safety of the transition process. And then finally, they thought about broader systemic forces such as pressures in hospitals uh, to free up beds um, and other health system pressures that influence these decisions. Next, healthcare providers also um, categorized their work in transitions into two other areas. So the second was organizing and facilitating logistics of transition. And so this included things like preparing caregivers for the care they'd have to provide at home, giving education and support about medications and equipment, and also helping to facilitate transportation logistics. Healthcare providers also were responsible for coordinating and collaborating transitional care across sectors. And this is where we saw work happening between uh, inpatient, the inpatient palliative care team and the home-based palliative care team. And this was uh, communication between them, liaising and documentation, um, often not using shared electronic medical records, which were problematic, and different types of collaboration. Next. 
So from this work, we can conclude that it, this transition process is complex and we need future research uh, to examine how to better assist these clinicians with this transition. Um, given the success that we saw of interventions um, to improve communication during transitions um, and the benefit of discharge support services, so this is from our other systematic review, high quality studies should be conducted to support the implementation and continuation of these services. Uh, there's also a need um, to not just put the pressure on the individual providers and the organizations, but there needs to be uh, broader national level work to support and facilitate these transitions. Next. Okay, so from that systematic review and qualitative meta synthesis, we got a sense of the status quo of interventions to improve transitions, as well as what are healthcare providers' perspectives. We didn't find very strong literature on the patient caregiver perspective. So we wanted to understand better um, what patients and caregivers think about um, these transitions. So this work was uh, published recently in the Journal of Pain and Symptom Management. Next. So the aim here and what was novel about this study was we were exploring patient and caregivers' expectations and subsequent experiences of the hospital to home transition. We also wanted to develop a substantive grounded theory to enhance our understanding of how these transitions work. So this study was uh, conducted at two time points. So we identified patients who were receiving inpatient palliative care at two hospitals, Mount Sinai Hospital and Toronto General Hospital, both in Toronto. And uh, we interviewed those patients before they went home, um, but had been identified for discharge. And then we followed up with those patients uh, once they were home and had received care from the home-based palliative care physician. And this work was conducted from October 2018 to October 2019, and we used grounded theory methodology. So uh, we included adults receiving inpatient palliative care who were being discharged home, and we included family caregivers. So we um, in total had 39 participants, 18 patients, uh, seven caregivers on their own, and seven patient and caregiver dyads. And in total, we had 52 interviews that were conducted. Next. So this is the study flow diagram. We screened um, 122 people for eligibility. We approached 70 people for consent, and then roughly half of the individuals approached for consent did consent and participate in the study. Uh, you can see there was some dropout uh, between interview one and interview two. And some of the reasons we did not collect a second interview where patients died um, or the patient and caregiver were no longer eligible because they were not they were not transferred home in the end, and some individuals were lost to follow up. But we did conduct in total 20 interviews uh, that involved both a visit one and a visit two. Next slide. Okay, so this is the theory that we developed, and uh, Caitlin, this is the slide that has animation. So if you could just click once. Um, for the first part. Okay, so this is the theory we designed, which looks at hospital ho transition needs that patients and caregivers have, and enablers and disablers that facilitate those needs. So uh, next, the first area of needs were health and well-being needs for both the patient and the caregiver, and this related to things like safety, concerns about going home, psychosocial supports, um, as well as just physical needs um, like you know, making sure that symptoms were well managed. Um, and this really was identified in every single interview as a need that people had and were concerned about when they were in hospital and were thinking about once they were at home. Next. The other area of needs we labeled as practical needs and we broke this down into three categories. So the first was just, how are you getting home from hospital? And this was really something that a lot of people thought about. And in many situations, people used an ambulance to get home, but at other times they were um, provided uh, rides from loved ones. Um, but importantly, there are a lot of issues with delays with ambulance, miscommunications um, and challenges in that respect. The other practical need was setting up the home for care. So these were adjustments that had to be made in the home. Uh, oftentimes these, these patients receiving palliative care 
uh, went into hospital at a certain level of functioning. And because of the reason they were hospitalized and deterioration, they were going home at a very different level of functioning. And so things had to be adjusted in the home, including bringing in a hospital bed, um, setting up lifts to go upstairs if the bathroom wasn't on the main floor um, and making different adjustments like that. There was also equipment that had to be brought into the home like oxygen um, and also making sure that there was access to the medications that were needed. The final practical need was healthcare providers in the home. So most patients in the study were, all patients in the study were receiving home-based palliative care by a palliative care physician, um, but all patients were also getting support from nurses, personal support workers, um, and in many situations, uh, physical therapy, occupational therapy, and in some situations, social work. So these needs um, are actualized by enablers and disablers. So next, and next. Okay, so several different uh, distinct enablers and disablers were identified. So first was caregiver's role. And this was a lot of the responsibility of coordinating the care and making sure there was a smooth transition home and access to the right resources fell on the caregiver. And this is oftentimes some patients were heavily involved in also in coordination, but in many situations, these patients were quite frail um, and relied on their caregivers. The other uh, enabler was community support. So this is support from non-primary caregivers, um, like other family members, members of the church, uh, neighbors, and uh, this really helped with health and well-being needs. Then there was education that was provided to um, figure out how to get care in the home. And this was often education that healthcare providers gave to the caregivers and patients to help them navigate this new health status. Uh, the other enabler, which comes up a lot in the literature, is communication and coordination between providers and between providers and um, patients and caregivers. And uh, this uh, often manifested as lack of communication and coordination was a disabler to needs being met. And both, that includes both health and well-being needs, but also practical needs. Uh, two disablers that are really noteworthy are uncertainty. So this was a general sentiment about not knowing uh, what was going on uh, with their care and needing um, some clarity. And oftentimes that clarity was not provided. And finally, financial resources. So. Um, Though this study was conducted in Ontario, and we do know that there is a universal health care system and publicly provided home care, in many situations, what was available publicly was insufficient, and uh, patients and caregivers had to find means of paying for additional supports that were needed. Uh, next. So what does this uh, theory look like in action? So I'm going to share some quotes for each of the needs and enablers, disablers. But before we go into that, I want to share a story about one of our participants. So this was a caregiver who was a 54-year-old man who was caring for his 89-year-old mother. Um, and the mother had been living with him and his wife um, and relatively high functioning. Then she had a stroke and ended up in hospital and uh, the mother became uh, unable to really communicate and the palliative care team communicated uh, with the caregiver that the mother was at the end of life. And the son knew that his mother's uh, preference was to be at home at the end of life. And so he worked with the palliative care team to facilitate that. And so we connected with him uh, while his mom was still in the hospital, but had been, they were planning to send her home. And he had several, um, the patient had several needs that needed to be met. Um, she was essentially bed bound at the time. And so she really needed a lot of support uh, with her physical needs and activities of daily living. The caregiver also had a need for psychosocial support and was very um, stretched thin um, by this sudden change in his mother's health status. Uh, in terms of practical needs, the ambulance to take the mother home was delayed, which was very distressing uh, for the caregiver. And um, when the ambulance got to the, care the caregiver's house, they had to bring the mother up the stairs and they had a lot of difficulty navigating the house and facilitating that for them. Uh, there were also challenges with setting up the home for care. So various equipment and medications arrived and they arrived before the healthcare providers did. So the caregiver was left not knowing how to administer or deal with any of this equipment and what to do 
Um, the patient did receive care from a palliative care physician in the home and the caregiver was very happy with the care that was provided. Um, but there was initially a delay with the nurse and personal support worker arriving, which was very distressing um, given uh, the frailty of the mother. Uh, the caregiver was actively involved in terms of enablers and disablers with um, coordinating all aspects of care. He was a project manager as a profession and felt that there was a real lack of uh, structure and organization in how um, things were orchestrated. Uh, the caregiver's wife was also helping him to support his mother at home and his daughter was also actively involved. Um, they didn't get a lot of education around how to support their mother and that was frustrating to them. Uh, they didn't get much communication before the mother went home and this was challenging, though eventually um, a couple of days into the mother being home, they were supported. Uh, there was a lot of uncertainty and um, this couple uh, had the financial means to support their mother and so were able to supplement her care as well as uh, you know, take the, the respite from work that they needed in order to help um, support the mother at home. Uh, so next slide. So these are just some quotes uh, from this caregiver. So he said the whole process of getting her home and set up was turbulent and haphazard. Uh, for this caregiver, he described the transition process as rudderless and said he was in a great deal of distress. And though the patient was receiving um, home care, the caregiver said he was running on almost a 24 hour schedule and was worried about his, his physical and emotional stamina. Um, he said he had very little oversight on the transition process and often had to wait until the information finally came down like a sledgehammer. And then it was like, okay, what do you want to do? So it was very abrupt. And uh, the caregiver was overwhelmed by competing work and home obligations. Um, and he felt he had not been guided through how to monitor and what to look for in his mother. So he had a very challenging experience. Um, and we heard this from many um, participants in the study. So next. So going back to the uh, theory that we developed, um, another patient, uh, just to demonstrate what health and well-being needs might look like. In the first visit, when we saw this woman in the hospital, she said, I'm scared because I'm not gonna have somebody in the home 24 seven. What if I fall? If somebody's not there, I get hurt. And then in the second visit, once we saw her in the home, she said, after a couple of days, I realized this ain't so bad. I can manage here by myself. So often there was a lot of apprehension when people were still in the hospital, but eventually after some time being at home, they were comfortable with the situation. Next. And in terms of practical needs, just one example of setting up the home for care. So this caregiver said, I thought we would be okay, but it's only when he got home and we had to lie on this Chester field, which is narrow. Then I recognize that things are different and that I need to rearrange everything in the room, get more equipment. I wish I had known that before. And so sometimes this uncertainty can be mitigated by an occupational therapy assessment. But in this situation, um, the caregiver had not had someone come into their home to let them know that things needed to be modified. Next. So an example of the caregiver uh, role. So this caregiver said, I had to do the scheduling, deal with the personal support worker, deal with the nursing, deal with what he needs for equipment. So a lot of this navigation burden fell on the caregivers, which was challenging because they also had families to take care of and jobs to work and other responsibilities in their lives. Uh, next. So education was another enabler. Um, this caregiver said, I had to have a plan because they were coming in and out of the hospital 13 times a day. So the pharmacist came and he gave me a plan of when to give drugs and how much. Once I got home, the, her the nurse helped me scale it down to like six times and the doctor helped too. I can't imagine having to do 13 or 14 different things in a day. So uh, this caregiver did receive the education that she needed to help her figure out the appropriate medication administration schedule. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm going to skip through the next quotations because I think I've given you a, a good flavor of what these enablers and disablers look like. So if we could do uh, next and then next uh, and then next and then next. Thank you. 
Uh, so a lot of participants also provided suggestions for how to improve the transition, and these suggestions broke down into three areas. The, so the first was having written suggestions, and this involved pamphlets or binders that outlined the transition process. Though some people advocated for this, others said that they got so much written material from the hospital, from home care, that another paper was not going to be helpful. The other thing that a lot of people um, advocated for was having additional personnel, which involved a care coordinator or service provider concierge or discharge planner that would help the patient and caregiver navigate the transition. And then the final thing that people talked about was the need of information exchange between settings. And so I probably don't need to tell this audience, but there is a disparate uh, grouping of different electronic medical records across the province and different settings, electronic medical records don't speak to each other. And so because of that, a lot of information had to be repeated each time a different provider came in. Uh, next. So what can we conclude uh, from this study? So our theory highlighted potentially measurable constructs that can be further tested. But importantly, um, none of the interventions that we looked at in the systematic review address the entirety of the theory we've identified. And we think that future interventions should target the enablers and disablers um, to better ensure that the needs are met in the transition. And so this study it definitely has implications for COVID, though it was conducted prior to COVID. We see more and more patients preferring to stay in the home at the end of life out of concern of going to the hospital during COVID. And we've also seen an influx in more patients being discharged home from hospital um, in palliative care. So better understanding how to facilitate that transition is really important. Um, so I now I'm gonna pass it over to Stephanie to talk about two other studies that we conducted on this topic. Uh, next. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Serena. Um, so I'm going to be discussing our mixed method study, which examined the course of the transition from the hospital to the home uh, to home based palliative care. Um, and next. And so we undertook a mixed methods approach because it offers a bit more of a complete picture than either quantitative or qualitative perspectives alone. And specifically, we wanted to develop insight into how palliative patients experience three common domains of transitions. And these domains were discharge readiness, transition quality, and post-discharge coping. And so we uh, collected this data alongside the qualitative um, study. So we had two visits, one in the hospital, the first of which looked at uh, this, completed a readiness for hospital discharge scale um, and completed a qualitative interview. And then at the second visit, which was three to four weeks once they were home, they completed the care transitions measure, which looked at uh, transition quality um, and post-discharge coping scale, along with that second uh, qualitative interview. And next. So for the analysis, we used a merged transformative design, um, and I won't go into too much detail about this, but it was very comprehensive, um, and we really compared and contrasted where the qualitative data and the quantitative data aligned and where uh, some of the discrepancies were. Our sample, again, was the same as our qualitative study uh, with uh, interviewing palliative care consult patients who were going from the hospital to the home um, and their caregivers as well. Next. And so overall, our findings from the quantitative data demonstrated that participants generally had low readiness for hospital discharge uh, in general, um, which was, again, using that readiness for hospital discharge, discharge scale. Uh, and they, the median score was 5.8, with a possible range of scores from zero being low readiness to 10 being high readiness. They also had moderate transition quality with a median score of 66.7. And the range for this scale was uh, zero to 100, with 100 being high quality and zero being low quality. And they also had poor discharge coping uh, as measured by the post-discharge coping scale um, with a median score of five. And again, that the range of that scale was from zero to 10. And so um, next. When combining though that quantitative data with the qualitative findings, we found that in general, positive transitions involved par participants feeling well supported um, by those around them. They felt that they were able to manage their medications well. They felt physically well, which was really important um, to being able to manage at home. 
and they felt that they had their health care needs met. So this male caregiver said, oh, the transition went smoothly. I was amazed. They came in, they set up the bed. It was two minutes and they were out the door. Then they brought the patient home, put him in bed, and it was just great. And so you can see how this kind of aligns. Uh, this is in instances where the qualitative and quantitative data um, aligned for positive transitions. Next. Uh, when combining the quantitative data with the qualitative findings, um, they also pointed out challenges in these transitions. And for participants, this involved feeling unwell, so kind of that opposite of feeling well, uh, confusion over their medications, really not understanding their responsibilities once they were home, and emotional distress about the transition in general. So here a female caregiver says, there's not one thing where I independently do for something for her. So like, there's nothing where I can say I independently 100% know how to do this. And I've fully done it and I'm confident in it by myself, you know, next. And in some cases, the qualitative data conflicted with the quantitative data. So we see here that there were some discrepancies, um, and these seem to have stemmed from patients and caregivers' eagerness to go home. So they were really excited about being at home, um, about not having their healthcare needs met, and unexpected reduced capacity once home. So within the hospital, they felt they might they were gonna, they were good to go. Once they were home, they were a little bit overwhelmed and not ready for what they actually experienced. So. For example, this female patient said, oh, I love being at home. It's much better than being in the hospital. You know, you sleep better, you eat better, you're around your family. Um, but then when we take, took a look at her quantitative scores, they were very, very low for both readiness for discharge um, and poor post-discharge coping. And so we teased out these themes as, reason, as potential reasons why. And next. So taken together, these findings, these findings really highlight the positive, challenging, and, conf and conflicting experiences of these three domains that are really important in palliative care for transitions, or transitions rather. Um, the themes stemmed from both aligned data areas, so both positive and negative uh, experiences. So we see that the positive transitions are areas that we can um, really try to amplify and support going forward. And the challenges that we'd identified for challenging transitions are areas that can be targeted uh, for interventions. With respect to the discrepancy in the data types, um, these are areas that we can really explore a bit more in future research to understand why, uh, why, why someone's eagerness, for example, might affect um, their readiness to go home. And next. And so among their last studies that was involved in this research program was a study that examined uh, the development and realization of a research through design knowledge translation approach within a palliative care context. And it was a really unique study because it was both a knowledge translation initiative where we wanted to share the findings from our qualitative study, as well as an op opportunity to generate new insights and new data into the experience of going home. Uh, next. And so the purpose of the study component was to use a novel and exciting KT approach to disseminate our findings from our research study overall, as well as generate uh, reciprocal insights from a broader community. And we did this through a process of partnering with a design team out of a design innovation firm called The Moment based in Toronto, along with an interdisciplinary clinical team, uh, patient uh, partner, um, and the research team being myself and Serena. And so our main outcome was to really present a design installation that conveyed the sense of medicalization of home at the end of life at Design to Yo, which is a festival um, in January 2020, which feels like an absolute lifetime ago. Uh, so I'm gonna, to achieve this, I'll walk you through it um, next. So we undertook a design process specifically that uh, the designers led us through. So we first reviewed inspirational designs and design features, and then we developed our own design principles, which were really grounded in our qualitative research transcripts um, and initial analysis. And from this, we developed the concept for our installation. And last, we prototyped the final project. So next. And so this was our final outcome, which again, we presented at Design Geo. So it was really designed to look like an entryway with an emphasis on the medicalization at home and featured quotes from our qualitative study. We had 1500 visitors attend the event um, and 100 inter attendees interacted with our installation. 
So next, our installation was titled Going Home to Die, and we had cards that attendees could write a wish or a worry for themselves or a loved one um, about going home to die. Uh, next, and to inspire them, we had quotes from our participants, uh, qualitative data up on the board, um, along with artifacts that might be common to see within a medicalized home setting. And next. And as I mentioned, attendees were invited to write down uh, one of four cards, a wish or a worry for themselves or someone they care about, about going home to die. Uh, next. And so at the end of the event, we took down all the cards and we analyzed the wish and worry cards, um, finding common themes throughout them that generally spanned uh, various temporal dimensions across past, present or future. Um, and then we sorted them into patient and or caregivers. Um, next, and this resulted in six different themes. So the first was a need for connectedness. We had caregivers needs too. We had readiness to die peace and comfort at end of life, loss of autonomy and independence, and health system considerations. And there's just some of the quotes up uh, from those cards. And next. And so making use of these themes and cards, we also develop need statements for caregivers and, their, and patients. Um, and these are just observations that, are, that we can use then to drive forward the development of solutions. And so we had these both for person who is dying, as well as um, next, the needs of the caregiver um, as well. And so I'll, La, uh, I'll skip ahead to the our, my last slide here. And just overall, we really want to highlight that this was a really novel and exciting opportunity. And it was interesting that although the prompts were for attendees to imagine going home to die, the results ended up being much more about dying in and of itself. Um, we found this as a really interesting way to offer to interact with um, the community and deliver insights from research as well as generating insights moving forward. Um, and these need statements that we developed would be a great jump off point from which uh, to develop solutions. So next, and with that, I'll pass it back off to Serena for another update of a KT effort that we did. Thank you, Steph. So we um, wrote an article in Healthy Debate, which um, as some of you may know, is an online, um, new source uh, that is healthcare oriented. And in this article, we focused upon uh, the need to improve hospital to home transitions at the end of life. So this was a way to reach out to a broader audience. And we got a lot of traction um, from this work and also got some interest from the general public. So we really thought it was important to share our findings broadly outside of the research world. Uh, so next. So we've shared a lot of different uh, research all on the hospital to home transition for palliative care patients. And I think we've represented what the literature shows, what the healthcare provider perspective is, um, and what the patient and caregiver perspective is, and what the general public thinks. So the next stages of this work are to design an intervention um, that improves this transition. So next. So in terms of next steps, we actually have an ongoing qualitative study that interviews healthcare providers involved in this hospital to home transition. And this work is being led by one of my master's students at the University of Toronto, Logan Roy, who I, I saw is on the call today. Um, and so Logan's work is really focusing on what does this collaboration across sectors and across individuals really look like. Um, the next stage uh, that I'm currently writing a grant for is to co-design an intervention that improves the transition process for patients and caregivers, uh, probably looking at discharge readiness and post-discharge coping as the outcomes, but through the co-design process, we'll finalize what are the most appropriate outcomes. And following from designing the intervention, we're going to have a single pilot site where we test the feasibility and acceptability of this intervention, and then eventually um, scale this up across multiple sites in Ontario to test the effectiveness of the intervention. Intervention. So we're going from understanding the status quo of these, of these transitions to improving them. Uh, next. And so just to conclude, some key takeaways from uh, what Steph and I have discussed is that these transitions um, are complex and require a great deal of collaboration and coordination. And we saw from both the healthcare provider perspective and the patient and family perspective all the challenges that exist. 
We also saw that family caregivers were deeply impacted by the quality of the transition and were heavily involved. And the systematic review showed us that while some interventions exist to improve this transition, there's no gold standard. And very few of these studies have actually been tested in the Canadian setting. And as we know, we have a unique healthcare system. Uh, there are also clear gaps in the transition process that translate into opportunities for intervention. And importantly, from the studies that Steph shared today, we saw that there's an interest within the general public to improve these transitions and that there's a lot of different needs um, that need to be addressed, not just those in our model, but those um, experienced more broadly. Um, so next, and then next. Okay, so uh, that's our summary of the research program and what we're planning to do with it. Uh, the slides will be sent out to you, but please feel free to reach out to myself and staff if you have any questions or are interested in getting involved. And with that, I'll pass it back uh, to Jasmine uh, to facilitate questions. Thank you both, uh, Serena and Stephanie. That was really interesting. Um, does anyone have any questions for either of our presenters today? None that I see. Um, I just wanted to maybe ask a question. Um, sounds like a lot of this research is done, um, you know, in, in large cities like Toronto, which is very resource heavy. How does this kind of work map onto uh, smaller townships, rural communities who maybe don't have the same sort of uh, resources accessible? What, what can those transitions look like there in those communities? So thank you for raising that. I think uh, with the next phase of this work, my hope is to include more remote rural communities and that would involve um, recruiting uh, from here in Ottawa uh, and from the Ottawa hospital where we have many patients who come from across the Champlain Lynn. Um, I think to your point, there are less resources in rural communities, though in Ottawa, we do have the regional palliative care team that serves the, the entire Ottawa and surrounding areas. And so they do go out um, to people's homes to provide palliative care. Um, but this transition process can be even more fraught. Um, there's also, you know, different uh, research studies, like a, another project I'm involved in, uh, was to develop uh, a remote monitoring tool for patients in these remote communities so that they can get access to care. Um, so there's definitely uh, different needs in rural areas. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Charlotte in the audience. Um, I have used the I wish, I worry, I want in other settings. Can you discuss further? Yeah, so the I wish I worry um, came from, there's a Japanese concept called uh, Ido cards, which are sort of like little sentiments that you share around hopes for the future. And so when we were brainstorming as a group, we were trying to think of ways um, to capture that in, uh, in categories that still allowed for a lot of room for sharing. And so we as a group thought of I wish and I worry, and I... I kind of organically thought of that, but I appreciate that it's been used in many other settings. I, I'm not familiar with the I wish I worry I want um, specifically, but we probably were borrowing from concepts that were floating around uh, unbeknownst to us. I don't know, uh, Stephanie, if you have anything you want to add to that. Yeah, no, that's great. Uh, not much to add. The only other thing I would say is um, one of the designers we were working with had also used something similar along um, I wish in what was a, the, an installation called reflection room I believe um, and so I think she also brought in uh, that concept of something that could fit on the card and what can we exactly what Serena said what can we uh, have that's broad enough to bring in new insights but also has offers a little bit of direction. Thank you. Yeah, that was a really beautiful design of that exhibit. That was really well done. 
Um, it doesn't look like we have any other questions from the audience. Um, so thank you everyone for attending today. The webinar will be available as a recording so you can check our social media channels for updates. Um, you can also reach out to us at the BRI IRB at Briere.org inbox. It's in the chat below. Um, if you enjoyed this session, then save the date for our next webinar on palliative care and delirium management on June 8th, 2021. And again, keep an eye on our social channels at Briere Care for more details. Thank you so much, everyone.